Now I want to discuss Dirk Bouts because he's a, a very interesting Netherlandish artist. Uh, he lived and worked in the city of Louvain and is documented there between about 1457 and 75. But he originally appears to have come from the Netherlandish city of Harlem, uh, which is far to the north near Amsterdam. Bouts is known for producing several altarpieces, um, and he's also known for a number of paintings that show the Madonna and Child. And we're going to be looking at three that have an almost identical pose with the Virgin and Child, and we'll be talking about his technique, and in particular, his use of ultramarine blue pigment derived from lapis lazuli, and some of the ways in which he... Uh, approached his painting method in order to save money and to uh, maximize the effect of that ultramarine. And some of those have sort of backfired today, hundreds of years later, some of the underpainting um, in his less expensive efforts has darkened and uh, obscured the use of the ultramarine. I just want to quickly point out the uh, distant landscape behind the Virgin. Uh, this appears to show some of the, the church towers in Lovain, uh, and sometimes we have recognizable landscapes like this from painters. Sometimes they simply put in a fantasy landscape, and you know maybe that's meant to drive art historians crazy. I don't know. Now we're looking at a detail from the other side of the painting, and I want you to particularly notice this cloth of honor that, that hangs behind the, the Virgin. A cloth of honor is an early medieval convention used to distinguish an important person. It was generally hung behind the thrones of kings to mark their importance, and you can see lots of examples in medieval manuscript illuminations as far back as at least the year 1000. By the 12th century, a rich cloth of honor would be used to mark the most important person in a painting. And by the 15th century, like the example we have here, this convention had long been in use for religious figures like the Virgin Mary and for Christ. The elaborate silk brocade that you see behind the Virgin in this painting is a painted version of what was the most expensive and desirable types of cloth uh, in Renaissance Europe. Um, this is uh, actual the the actual cloth would have been made of silk with uh, actual metallic threads beaten from gold and silver woven into it. And because of sumptuary laws that legislated what different people of, of different classes were allowed to own and wear, cloth like this was generally limited just for royalty, high-ranking churchmen, and the very wealthiest people. So it is uh, a signal immediately to someone that this is a person of incredible importance. And similarly, you see the same type of cloth uh, being used as a cushion for the baby Jesus. In order to create the pattern for this brocade cloth behind the Virgin and also the cloth uh, on the cushion for Christ, Bouts probably would have used the pouncing technique that we discussed when we were looking at ochre pigments. Um, what you would do is, of course, take ground pigment. In this example, uh, they're showing graphite or charcoal, and you would put it into a little bag and sort of uh, smack it up against a, a, a drawing that had been pierced. And you're seeing here in my example um, an inscription done in text. Um, and sometimes it's possible to identify particular artists by the uh, brocade pattern that they used. Um, and really elaborate brocade patterns uh, that could be reproduced in paintings would be passed down from master to apprentice or from father to son left in wills. And so you can trace uh, different workshops by the, uh, the unique use of uh, a particular brocade pattern. Now I want to discuss Dirk Bouts and 
uh, more of his painting techniques and the way that they relate to lapis lazuli. Conservators at the National Gallery in London found that, like many other uh, painters of his day, Dirk Bouts tended to be very sparing when he used ultramarine blue. And I'm showing you here a detail uh, in which I played around with the brightness level a little bit so that you can see the blue of the Virgin's mantle a little bit more clearly. Um, you'll notice that in the, the painting itself, which I haven't tickered with in, in Photoshop, that her mantle appears to be an incredibly deep blue and not that vibrant electric ultramarine that we associate with uh, the pigment derived from lapis lazuli. And there's a reason for that. And that is because Dirk Bouts did his underpainting using a much less expensive pigment, and that is azurite. Um, now, it was less expensive than lapis lazuli, but it was still expensive. Azurite uh, also had to be imported. It had to be crushed uh, and purified, but it was less expensive. The azurite was uh, used in the underpainting, um, and it was meant to uh, lay in the basic blue tones of the robe. And then on top, Dirk Bouts applied a thick glaze of ultramarine. The problem is that azurite reacted with the linseed oil that was used to mix the pigment into paint. And uh, it ended up uh, turning black over time turns to sort of a, a deep greenish black. So Bouts, of course, when he did this, didn't realize what the problem would be. Um, and he had, uh, you know, he was doing this to, in, in a very cost-effective way in order to uh, make it look as if the entire robe had been painted just with ultramarine rather than just doing the, the top layer. Um, and this is a, a technique that numerous artists had used. Um, since azurite discolors gradually over time, <clears throat> and you can see that here in this uh, section from that very painting, the, the layer there that looks sort of greenish blue and black all together, that's the azurite that has reacted with the linseed oil, and the linseed oil is showing up as gold. The, the translucent layer of ultramarine is up on top of that. And then the white layer down at the bottom, that's the, the ground that uh, the panel was originally painted with. Um, so Bouts probably had no idea this was going to happen um, and probably would have avoided having this happen. But uh, this is something that we see in a number of works. And again, it's a sign of the artist simply being a good businessman. They, they needed to live after all. I want to discuss uh, a little bit more of Bouts' work because he was the consummate businessman. What you're looking at here is a work that was made about five to ten years before the work we just looked at. And it's uh, a fairly small painting, just eight and a half inches high. Uh, you might notice that there's really no background at all, and that incredible dark uh, blue in the Virgin's robe is likely an indication that uh, with this painting also, uh, Dirk Bouts was using underpainting in Azurite. This is a painting that is based on a, uh, a famous type of Byzantine icon. Icons tended to be classified in types. Um, and this particular one is called the Sweetly Kissing Madonna or Glycophilusa. Uh, Byzantine icons were incredibly important in Western art. Uh, they had uh, a tremendous impact on the, the Western art market. Um, as early as the early medieval period, um, about the, the 10th century uh, and even earlier. 
And when the Crusaders sacked Constantinople in 1204, they brought back lots of icons. Um, and there were trade routes that continually brought works of art from, uh, from the Byzantine East into Western markets. And so here, Dirk Bouts is uh, responding to the popularity of icons and their poses and this intimacy between mother and child and creating his own version. We know from his use of uh, azurite as an underpainting uh, pigment for ultramarine that Dirk Bouts was quite the businessman and uh, definitely made sure that uh, he, he practiced his, his work very frugally. And here we're going to see another example of Dirk Bouts as a businessman. Uh, here are three paintings, the one that we looked at, uh, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York on the left, and then two copies in San Francisco and in Florence. And um, the two copies were made in Bouts's workshop, but most likely by his assistants, according to conservation reports. Um, these were probably, they're, they're clearly based on the New York painting, um, and it's very likely that uh, the, the workshop artists could have used the exact same cartoon and pounced it onto their panels um, in order to transfer that design. Um, certainly, they were looking very, very closely at uh, Bouts's original, and I also want you to notice that uh, works like this could be perhaps made to order for patrons with differing demands um, and differing amounts of money to spend. So the, the work from, from uh, in the middle in San Francisco has a really elaborate cloth of honor in the background. Uh, the Virgin has a rich red robe and a bit less ultramarine blue on her, although her gown is quite rich. And so perhaps the patron here wanted to pay a little bit more in order to get uh, a, a richer looking painting uh, with the brocade. The one on the right in Florence looks like uh, it's possible that the patron didn't have quite as much money to spend on ultramarine, because what we see here appears to just be azurite that has uh, decayed to that sort of greenish blackish tone, and we don't have any of that sort of rich resonance of bright ultramarine blue on top. So there are a number of uh, different considerations here, and we have to remember that uh, artists had to make a living. Uh, they were businessmen and businesswomen, and uh, they would also use the people in their shops, their apprentices and their assistants, uh, in order to uh, economize on labor. Oftentimes, uh, a painting contract will stipulate that the principal faces have to be done by the master himself, because people knew that assistants and apprentices might be working on pieces like this. Um, so what I want you to take away from this is the fact that when you're talking about expensive pigments like lapis lazuli, you have to take that expense into account. Um, we, we know that bright, intense blue is an indicator of the most important figure in a painting, but there are also shades to that blue that can help us understand the way in which the artist navigated the economics of that very expensive color blue.